this computer. All right, I believe we're recording. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Michael Pierce here, once again, speaking with Ilya Dubovoy. Uh, and Ilya has been kind enough to offer to give a presentation that uh, he has given already to the Jungian Society and on the channel Young to Live By. Um, and uh, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything else, but I'm very excited for this. I, uh, and we'll, we'll just be talking while, while he gives the presentation. Uh, but uh, Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to mention that this is not my day job. I'm a physician and a neurologist by training. I'm going to be starting a practice in coastal Virginia, but this is a project that I've been working on for a few years. Or rather, it's a project that I worked on a few years ago and have sort of tinkered with and has been back in, in the back of my mind. The basic message we sort of talked about in a previous video um, about some of the points and the questions and the interests that you had regarding this presentation when I gave it on uh, James's channel. Jung to live by, which subsequently he's, you know, turned in a different direction and um, uh, made uh, undiscoverable on YouTube, but... Uh, I'll post a link to it again in the description because I think you can still get to it by link, but yeah, yeah it's not publicly available. But this was another good reason to go over this again and with someone who has, you know, a different perspective, but also is interested in the same ideas. So without further ado, I kind of want to <clears throat> get to the meat of this presentation, which is really to explore the issue of teleology in nature. I first got interested in this when I heard a lecture by a uh, professor, uh, adjunct faculty at Tulane University. He was in the philosophy department. His name was uh, Professor Keith Silverman. And he was discussing Aristotelian ideas of teleology and nature and how it's kind of gone out of fashion, but provides a lot of useful, a lot of useful perspective and a, and a model that can explain interesting things. And some people got up and obviously made the typical sort of evolutionary neo-Darwinian arguments that, well, biological systems are not teleological. I thought, well, actually, I had just been reading about how mutations in bacteria are non-random and how there is something called, um, well, topic we'll get into in this presentation, but basically how bacteria are able to direct mutations that occur in their genome, both in time and place. So they can restrict and control when a mutation happens and where it happens. I mean, if that's not control, then uh, that seems to violate some of this idea of a lack of teleology, then I don't know what is. But uh, there was something that I brought up and we got to talking with Professor uh, Silverman and I went ahead and did some more digging and decided to kind of present my ideas in, in, a, in a presentation. And this is maybe the one, two, three, four, fourth or fifth version of this talk that I'm giving. And you'll have to excuse some background noise from, from the baby, but <laughs> that's- uh, He's not just, a, not just a doctor, he's also a father <laughs> who's moonlighting as a, as, as a neo-Aristotelian Jungian theorist. I, I shouldn't apply all these labels to you. <laughs> no, you got to be something, but uh, that's, that's where we are. Uh, hopefully I'll have, uh, soon a little bit better setup for audio quality and video quality and a better background. But in the meantime, we'll make do with what we have. So <clears throat> my purpose of this presentation was to sort of flesh out these teleological forces in nature, see what perspective or how through this perspective we can make sense of some of the findings in molecular biology which are coming to fruition and are seemingly contradicting and throwing new light into previous 
uh, models of evolution. And of course, uh, to talk, to think about how this all applies to certain models, metaphysical models of reality and Jungian psychology. In this case, the link between psyche and matter and the nature of the archetypes. So let me see, let me advance the slide, here we go. So we talked a little bit about this before, but just to recap there, to, to quote Carl Jung, right? What, what is an archetype? So the archetypal structure, quote, the archetypal structure of the unconscious corresponds to the average run of events. They are variations of certain typical occurrences. Okay, well, what was that? What is it, exactly does that mean? It means that these are sort of ultimate categories, categories of thought, categories of behavior, classifications, almost like instincts, right? Another way of thinking about it more philosophically is that these are philosophical categories, that these are kind of matrices, structures uh, that are filled with the uh, the existential reality that we experience and it automatically falls into these structures and crystallizes into these particular shapes it, it gives them our experiences give them content but ultimately these structures are something primordial something that exists <clears throat> pre-made with us with our biological with our physical substrate and to, to cut in here, this this you can people can already see the connection with Aristotle and even with Plato and with a lot of the Greek thinkers of the notion of form and content. That at least for them, they almost took it for granted that you have all of this matter, but it would simply be chaos if you did not have some notion of form, which is accessible by our minds somehow. We're able to formulate it into language and and order things in in reality and understand it. Um, the forms not being, which I believe is the point you'll be making, the forms don't have to be, how do I put it the right way? The way Jung put it, they're like instincts, they're patterns of behavior, and they arise naturally just from the logic of the way that the systems are constructed. And so they will always unfold in, in a certain way. I just wanted exactly. to- there's, a, yeah. there's an emergence to them. You can yes. Think of them as uh, mathematically kind of like being, um, you know, uh, attractors or emergent properties of a system, which kind of happens through its evolution in time. So these things, they're not some sort of right, this, this, isn't, this isn't some eternal platonic form necessarily, but it is a, a, a real structure of information that, that is useful to our model of reality. It provides pretty good explanatory and predictive power, which is the what we can ask for, the best we can ask for in any model. Right? I, I don't take a you know a realist versus nominalist approach. I mean, I don't think that there's anything that's real, real, right? These are all categories of thought that make thinking more useful. You can think of it that way. Um, of course, there are, so this, on this slide, you'll see some examples of maybe these archetypal or logical categories, which are useful, the split of self and other, right? So an organism has a internal milieu and an external environment, pretty, pretty basic. Yeah, that's from the very, the very beginning when you have just bacteria, you have the bacteria it creates its cell wall, and then there's the stuff inside and outside of it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's perhaps one of the most ancient ones. Um, exactly, exactly. Uh, and you see, uh, as you go on, perhaps in life, the development of other archetypal categories, such as male and female. We discussed this a bit in our last talk, but we'll touch upon it here again. Uh, so the nature of um, uh, sort of sex and the genome and, and life. And you see other aspects that 
archetypes that perhaps you could derive from some of the things that we'll discuss in the presentation, such as the idea of a sacrificial hero, the uh, sort of the transformative, the archetype of transformation and development. These are all things that are intrinsic to life as any organism passage passes through stages of development, um, at least more advanced ones. One of the things so I, these I are, oh, again, these are my apologies. <laughs> I, so I was I just I was just going to jump in again real quick and, and say one of the things I find so fascinating about Jung is his emphasis on how trying to show how these things would arise, like we said, as emergent properties, how something that we consider as complex and even spiritual as the notion of the sacrificial hero, you can find that form if you're willing to, to look through a particular lens all over the place in, in nature, the notion of things sacrificing themselves for greater good, or um, uh, 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 it would take me too long to, to abstract it, but I feel like you can really abstract that notion down to some very, very simple notions that you can find all over the place of, of sacrificing of yourself in order to gain something greater. Um, it's just really interesting seeing how you can then apply it to all kinds of different fields. But um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, these are just things to keep in the back of our head as we go forward and, and so we don't get lost in the minutia and the details of the yeah. uh, sort of mechanistic detailed processes that I'll be discussing later. And uh, don't, and another thing that we discussed before, but it, it's important to emphasize here, it's not to confuse the the symbol with the thing itself, to the extent that we can experience it in our senses. These images all sort of reflect various aspects. The particulars are not equivalent to the archetype itself, which is sort of a liminal phenomenon on the perhaps edge of subjective and objective reality. It's sort of, it's not about the Try we try not to get confusing. Try not to confuse the map with the terrain. This is what I'm saying here. Right. Nevertheless, uh, pretty much the question is how how closely are we able to even experience the terrain uh, through the lens of our own consciousness? I mean, that's 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 the issue that is kind of at the bottom of of, of philosophy and a lot and a lot of a lot of problems. <laughs> so. Carl Jung talked about the psychoid nature of the archetype. This was the idea that, quote, the position of the archetype would be located beyond the psychic sphere, analogous to the position of the physiological instinct, which is immediately rooted in the stuff of the organism and with its psychoid nature forms the bridge to matter in general. So what does this mean? This means that archetypal categories have sort of layers of validity. There are different levels at which they are reflective of an accurate model. These levels can be at the level of spiritual symbols, or it can be at the level of material reality and everything in between. The old idea was that life <clears throat> is somehow animated matter it's matter that has been brought to life with some sort of higher spiritual spirit. Spirit, animus, anima, it's the same, same thing with, with breath. This is the, the old model, but as we will talk about the scientific method, which is the method of empirical reasoning, the Baconian method has kind of prioritized an unspoken philosophical emphasis on materialism and reductivism. And while it has struggled with the material manifestations of the archetype, it is interesting to note that physicists have kind of come up against and discovered that the universe consists of energy and information to an extent, not just matter, not just atoms in the void. And this, interplay between matter, energy, and information can be thought of as kind of the, the structural or archetypal domain of, of, uh, of reality. 
And I will say, um, I've been doing I've been doing more research into physics. I did my quantum quantum physics videos a little bit ago. But as I've been going into it, I've been noticing that uh, at least in philosophy and the philosophy of quantum mechanics, there's a bit of a there's been serious interest brewing around the young Pauli work that was being done where and serious interest in the idea of there being I need to do a little more research on it, but there being an underlying archetypal reality from which the realms or, or the realms that we refer to as, as the material or the mental um, sort of arise out of it. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting that I, I always like to see Jung being taken more seriously in any academic setting, <laughs> um, even if he has to have, uh, have uh, Polly as his wingman to do it. But anyway, I just was happy about that. But the other thing I will note is that's very interesting is um, there, there's several philosophers who've been pointing out that um, people want to create this division between the quote material or physical and the mental or the spiritual or different things as though we already knew what the physical was when in fact if we've learned anything from modern physics is that we have no freaking clue what the physical is we don't know how it works it's non-local it's non-contact it, it it's it's energy it's information we're still figuring it out so there doesn't we're kind of in a limbo at the moment where there's no reason to constantly assume that, oh, it's all material and that excludes these properties we consider to be mental. There's no real reason to assume that. That's to be working off of a very outdated, wholly mechanistic model that really got thrown out as far back as Newton when he was like gravitation works instantaneously across space. Now, that's not completely true, but but we still haven't found any gravitons. That's why they're still working on quantum gravity. Anyway, I'll, I'll go on for too long. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's all val valid points. Science is underdetermined, philosophically speaking. That is to say, well, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but yeah, there are, there are definitely problems with the models. And this, is an, this presentation, another of its goals is to sort of highlight the stagnation that has occurred in biological sciences because of these outdated ways of thinking. I mean, we see it in physics too. Um, people complain about it all the time that we ha haven't really had any breakthroughs in about 70 years because of the way that things have been ingrained. But it's a problem everywhere. Um, but uh, we'll go on to, oh, this is a kind of a cool slide to those just listening to the audio and not hearing, I mean, not seeing, there is a, <clears throat> a picture that I like here. It's a depiction of, um, of the angel. Uh, of wrestling God. Jacob. Uh, yeah, uh, wrestling with Jacob, with Jacob Israel. And, it, and the caption says, the, the angel said to him, stop hitting yourself. But he could not stop, for the angel was hitting the him with his own hands. It's, it's actually even funnier when you have the image because that's actually what it looks like yeah, is looks happening. Like bullying him with making him smack himself. It's funny. It's, it's this old Gustave Dory image, so it's very venerable. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so we talk about a little bit of this. Oh, uh, oh another work of art on the, <laughs> on the screen. Yeah. Bender Bending Rodriguez mm. of uh, Futurama fame. And, you know, this is exactly what we were just talking about. The difficulties with um, the reductive thinking in science, which has really influenced uh, biology a lot. In fact, one of the ways in which we can see this kind of intersection between theory of mind, biology, and sort of modern scientific materialism has been in the difficulties with AI, artificial intelligence. And um, perhaps the slide's a little bit out of place, but one thing that we can think about is why are we having so much difficulty making an AI that is like a biological uh, system? That is, <clears throat> we can, Perhaps we haven't reached the level of complexity and capacity that even a very, very simple organism has from a, 
you know, from a technical standpoint. But there is good reason to believe that the fundamental differences between living things and non-living matter is great enough that the sort of the fear of AI consciousness is, is a bit overblown. Although that's not really the, you know, some of the more modern concerns that people have with this um, AI systems. But one of the points is we see that uh, in the development of what was called symbolic AI, it was thought that all you had to do was put in a bunch of rules and then uh, a machine would be able to figure out things as well as a human being just by having millions of facts and being able to process them quickly. Well, it it's, didn't yeah. didn't actually work that way. As no, <laughs> not at all. It still and, amazes me, kind of the hubris. I don't want to make fun. They were these. There's some good work done there, but it it it's just so obvious to me why that wouldn't work. <laughs> Exactly. But, uh, I'll quote here from uh, Herbert Dreyfus on uh, from a yeah. paper why Heideggerian AI failed and how fixing it would require making it more Heideggerian. Yes. Um, so uh, my interlocutors countered that although extremely complex, the human brain is clearly an instance of matter amenable to the laws of physics. They posited a reductionist and computational approach to the brain that many, including Steven Pinker and Daniel Dennett, continue to champion today. Our intelligence and everything else that informs our being in the world had to be somehow coded into our brain circuitry. And uh, so on and so forth. <clears throat> they assume that our brain store discrete thoughts, ideas, and memories at discrete points, and that information is, quote, found rather than evoked by humans. In other words, the brain was a repository of symbols and rules which map the external world into neural circuits. And so the problem of creating AI was thought to boil down to creating a gigantic knowledge base with efficient indexing. Uh, that is, the researchers thought that a machine could be made as smart as a human being by storing context-free facts and rules. Okay, so uh, this was something that Marvin Minsky worked on in MIT's AI lab and claimed to be able to recreate human common sense with just a few million facts. But the quote, the frame problem, as this last problem is called, that is the ability to recognize the importance of any particular fact in the world, eventually became insurmountable for the symbolic AI research paradigm. And uh, Dreyfus expressed the problem thus, quote, if a computer is running a representation of the current state of the world and something in the world changes, how does the program determine which of its represented facts can be assumed to have stayed the same and which might have to be updated, right? So whenever you make any kind of assumption about the interaction of objects in the world, you have everything in tow. So there is no one fact that's isolated. Everything yes. is linked to everything else. And this is a problem with science actually in general, which is part of what's called the Duem Quine thesis. The idea that all, all models of nature are undetermined. That is, if you have a theory and you find some sort of anomaly, you don't know actually which part of your theory you should change or which you can throw out. You don't know which of your ideas is falsified by that contrary and unexpected observation. It basically means you have to throw everything out every time something new happens, but that's not possible, right? right? right. That's, it's not possible. And yet that is logically what is what any new fact or observation or contrary evidence requires. And that's just not how science or anything can be practically done. What this fact does is basically um, undermine any kind of epistemological sanctity that science you know, pretends to. In reality, science is not a more epistemologically valid way of seeing the world or approaching the world than others. And this is a, this is a dirty little secret 
that uh, everyone Getting tries pretty to... radical there, sir. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, little, it's a little radical, but it's logic. Oh, no. well, oh yeah. But fortunately, that's where the logic points. So you cannot claim that you are, uh, you know, someone who upholds logic and reason 100% and then fail to, and then sweep the contradictions of the system under the rug. So you have to face, face the facts that, you know, you can't, you have to have a great degree of, of hubris for uh, when it comes to scientific theories of any kind. If I can jump in here real quick, I have a number of ideas. That was, that was wonderful. Um, the first one is early on in the quote, the very first thing that came to my, to my mind is that they had this assumption that, oh, it all reduces to the laws of physics as though we know what the laws of physics are. And we're still we're still in kind of flux about that. We talk big, but it we don't really people still argue about what non locality from the bell experiments are. You can watch my video if you don't know what that is. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but but um, so that was the first thing that was just fascinating to me is the assumption that we know what the physical is. Therefore, you know, that's what our reduction is, is we're reducing down to something we know, but the bottom has been taken out. So you're just dropping the brain through the floor. Um, uh, uh, oh, your, your thing is, uh, oh, whoops. Sorry, no. <laughs> you see behind the curtain. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that it reminded me of is as I've thought about, as I've tried to learn more about Heidegger and, and seen very clearly how it relates to AI, um, at least the way that I, I've framed it is, um, in, in my book and in my, my typology studies, I've drawn this distinction between what I call the contextual and the universal. I think I might have talked about this a bit with you, where the, the, the contextual, I would argue, and, and I think I make this argument explicit in the book, um, that everything human and everything living, um, and in some sense, everything in the universe, technically everything material boils down to contextual. So we are wholly contextual, even though some personalities are able to become more universal. So the contextual means that you see everything from your point of view as a living creature who has to eat and poop and die um, and kill. And you're framing, so like what you said with the models, you're, you, you, it, it's only with li only living creatures could come up with models that could have internal inconsistencies and not end up like getting themselves killed instantly because we we change things and we are inconsistent because we're reacting to immediate it's not even reacting to stimuli it's this this deeper problem of we posit goals and we have desires heidegger would say we care about things and that's something that we we can't that um we can't put into an ai and that's also something that the universal mentality tries to avoid. The universal mentality wants to essentially escape the body and view everything uh, uh, from sort of this higher point of view. And that is how a lot of scientists are. They're more universal in this sense. And they that's why they kind of forget that all of their theories, which they think, you know, they've gotten up above reality, but really they're still, it's, it's just a very clever expression of, of their original contextual standpoint. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. I got a little garbled there, but yeah, no, no, that, that does make sense. It's kind of the idea of, uh, you know, of, of reason trying to impose itself on on matter and reality in a way that. Sorry, I love it. <laughs> you hear the screaming in the background? <laughs> <laughs> or no? Uh... Is it there? Oh, it, it was there for a moment. I was going to make a joke of, look, there, there is a way to create true AI. Um, it's a very non-scientific process, but, <laughs> but yeah, it works better. That, that's a dumb joke. On its own, interestingly. <laughs> um, no, yeah, this is, uh, this is sort of the hubris of, uh, of the, the rational mind trying to impose itself on matter, um, trying to build its, build its castles in the sky in a way that's divorced from from reality. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of uh, religious stories and uh, myths about this sort of thing of, of Faust, of yeah. uh, the rebellious angel Lucifer, and all these kinds of uh, kinds of ideas. Um, and that's sort of 
sort of what we'll get at at the end here. But um, but yeah, I hope this uh, this certainly makes some sense, or at least raises some interesting questions. So uh, other other ideas of teleology um, are not completely absent from you know, various modern philosophy, more modern philosophers as well. We have de Chardin, who uh, mainly a, a Catholic thinker, however, was very much interested in the idea of evolution. Um, he believed that this, uh, the whole process of evolution represented a sort of idea of, of God becoming uh, becoming himself, God becoming conscious through the manifestation of life and the physical universe, um, ultimately culminating in something that these uh, sort of internet, transhumanist, techno people have co-opted the sort of the omega point, mm -hmm. the idea where consciousness, uh, all consciousness is unified. Um, this is an idea that has been actually influential in the modern world, despite people often not knowing where it comes from. And it's fundamentally very religious uh, nature. Only just recently discovered De Chardin, I guess it would have been last year, found him in a used bookstore and had no idea who he was. And was like, who is this like, he must be some like random 60s American or something from the new age, but maybe he's got some ideas. And he's like, no, no, no. He, he's only got black and white photographs of him. He's from, <laughs> he's from the early 1900s. He's a Catholic scientist thinker. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm still getting into him, but uh, it, it, it resolved a lot of interesting questions of where did this term Omega Point come from? Oh, it come yep. from this Catholic guy. Um, yep. But yeah, anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, tr tracing the lineage of words and ideas is a very useful exercise. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what is the status quo now, so to speak, or not really. We're in flux, but this was the dominant sort of paradigm of how adaptive change occurs in organisms. It was called the neo-Darwinian paradigm. Now, what does this term mean? Well, the bottom line is that the neo-Darwinian paradigm is also known as the modern synthesis. And um, the latter name actually more accurately, more accurately reflects the origins of the theory because it's a synthesis of Mendelian population genetics with the aforementioned Darwinian theory of natural selection. Now, Darwin just proposed that organisms change over time due to the selection of sufficiently fit individuals by the environment. As the environment changes, those individuals with better variations, the ones that are adapted, tend to survive. <clears throat> he didn't really propose any mechanism. Um, for example, Lamarck, who famously proposed that acquired characteristics of an animal can be passed on to its offspring, again, without any clear mechanism though, this idea is in no way incompatible with Darwin's theory of natural selection. It simply provides an alternative or parallel mechanism by which an organism can evolve. So many people yes. will will attack you for, for saying that. Well, many, they will, but th that's yeah. what Darwin wrote in his yep, yep. Uh, in his Origin of the Species. Origin of Species. That's um, I mean, you can anyone can pick up Darwin and read what he wrote. Unfortunately, what people think he wrote isn't what he actually wrote. There's um, a lot of dogma kind of yes, applied on to him. Laid on, and we'll sort of talk about why. I think there are, again, unstated philosophical and metaphysical assumptions to a lot of these uh, ideas. <clears throat> but the trouble with Lamarck, why is it so vehement, vehemently fought against, is, is really because Lamarckism suggests agency. Yes. Right? It suggests will to power um, on 
on top of a materialistic model of biology that became dominant in the 1950s. And that was completely anathema to people like Huxley, Dawkins, Dennett, Ernst Mayer. Um, it flew in the face of this reductionistic materialistic model. Um, so the ridicule, the denial, the, the vitriol, all the emotional response is really, uh, you know, Freud pointed out, why is uh, anytime you have this emotional response to this, to a scientific argument, is really that it, it's getting at something metaphysical, it's getting at something personal and philosophical, uh, rather than cold hard facts. Yes. So there are some issues. Why, uh, why do variants, how do variants of organisms arise in the first place? Um, the, the issue, this is an issue in the paradigm of the modern synthesis. Again, we talked about Mendelian population genetics, which is sort of a fixed gene pool that fluctuates and natural selection environmental pressures. But where, do, where does novelty come from to begin? Well, random mutation was proposed actually later um, as a way to shore up this question. But in reality, the idea of random mutation, which actually is something that people have been taught, is utterly unfounded. Oh, it's see, I, I, unfounded. I was I was about to give I had almost like it's almost like the <laughs> I should maybe I shouldn't say brainwashing. I'm sure you'd probably agree there's a brainwashing element. But I was like about to spout out like, well, it's mutation, right? Right. I'm smart. I went to school. It's mutation. Well, it is mutation. I want to hear this. This is very interesting. But uh, is it random mutation? Oh, okay, okay. Right, right. So the, the Ran yes, random mutation. The assumption is randomness to this mutation, because if mutations are non-random, right, then, then you have to get the question of what determines the direction of mutational change. Yes, and that throws a possibility of all kinds of non-reductionist, non-materialistic, and non-random uh, phenomena com coming into the works. Just as a, a quick side note, not to derail you, but oh, I, no, just had, I just had the thought where I'm like, there's kind of, a, there's a really interesting, I guess it's not irony, but because uh, in physics, you had this real shock when, when they've repeatedly kind of had to discover again that somehow things down at the bottom level have this indeterminacy built into them, which you've probably heard of. It's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's, a, there's this indeterminacy in where things will show up. Um, and that shocked them. But with biology, it's almost like the, the opposite, where what shocked them in physics was we thought everything was little billiard balls and it was Laplacian and we could predict where everything was going to be, but it turns out we can't do that at all. Um, whereas in biology, they're like, oh, we can't predict what's going to happen. It's completely indeterminate. It's random mutations. Um, but what would shock them is to find that it's not random. It's it's just kind of interesting the the how you have these two, you have on the one side, they want everything to be predictable. Um, but then you go up the up the stream and they depend on everything being unpredictable. Sure. Um, well, well, the randomness actually helps your predictive models in this case, because okay. the kind of models they would use are what we would think of in physics as um, kind of mass action models. Of oh, physics. I see. I see. So you're looking at collectives of particles. So you don't think of organisms as individuals. You think of them as gene pools. Right. And the various pressures on the gene pools. And you look at mass action of particles. So it's more like a thermodynamics perspective. I see. But so by making it random, it makes it so it, you can treat yeah. certain things easier mathematically yeah. or treat them at all mathematically. OK, yeah. Right. There's, a, there's like, like a Brownian motion that you are that you set at the base of your genetic assumptions. And that makes things easier. Right. So that's, uh, that's the assumption. Um, in this case, yeah, it makes their models the, the big mathematical models of evolution that, that were popular, much, much more workable. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit actually. So let's, but let's dig a little bit deeper into where 
this idea of random mutation and the mechanism of, of variation, the origin of variation came from. So Charles Darwin, as I mentioned himself, did not propose a mechanism for, for natural selection. He came up with a, you know, a very clever observation from the, about the interaction of organisms in their environment. In fact, he speculated um, that maybe like sperm and eggs, the germ cells were influenced by somatic signals from the body mm -hmm. of the organism based on its experience. So he, I remember, I remember that part early on where he talks about acqu acquired characteristics. I, I don't think he puts it that way, but right, I, I no, need, I need to read the section again. Keep going. Keep but going. It definitely is a sort of Lamarckian tendency, um, in a way. We would think of it in a modern sense, but not literally what Lamarck wrote, and it wasn't conceived of that at, like that at the time, but that's what Darwin speculated about. However, the modern synthesis rejects the heritability of acquired characteristics, and it really has its origins in that regard. Um, it has its origins with the germplasm theory of Weismann. So he proposed that the hereditary material generated the soma, the body, and this was passed, but the hereditary material, the germplasm, was passed down independently. Um, to quote his, 19, his 1893 work, quote, we must assume natural selection as opposed to inheritance of acquired characteristics. That's my addition. We must assume uh, that this is the to be the principle of explanation of the metamorphoses because all other apparent principles of explanation fail us. And it is inconceivable that there could yet be another capable of explaining the adaptations of organisms without assuming the help of a principle of design. So he wasn't, he was the first to really frame this false dichotomy between the two evolutionary theories of, uh, you know, one of design, presumably by God or aliens or whatever is fashionable, on the one hand, and on the other hand, sort of the random number generator of nature playing against the random number generator of the germplasm, aka DNA, aka random mutation thereof. So uh, he's not really conceive of any capacity for intentional change on the part of the organism itself. This is all a one-way street. Right. The, uh, germplasm interacts through the soma. I mean, it creates the soma, and that interacts with the environment. The germplasm is sort of a privileged territory, which is in many ways protected from the environment. And that's, uh, you know, interesting assumption, um, which was actually maintained. Whoops. It was maintained by... Uh, by, by Crick, <laughs> who was the originator of the ironically named central dogma hypothesis in biology, right? So he was a hard-headed materialist, despite the rumors that he uh, used LSD and the resulting visions inspired him regarding the structure of DNA. Oh, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There's, he, he denied it. In, he didn't even deny it in an interview. I think he stormed out of the interview or something. Oh, okay. Past. But there was uh, his partner, of course, Watson, um, became kind of a very far out there kind of guy. Oh, and, I had no idea. Uh, he, he implied, I think, on occasion that they were, you know, inspired by sort of mystical revelation. Um, the what I would give to find out that were true, but <laughs> uh, but I'll 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 stick with uh, for 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 the sake of courtesy I'll stick with Crick's storming out of the room. But I would it it would be beautiful in my mind just as a side note because that seems to have happened a couple of important points in scientific history. Descartes, for example, uh, as I understand it, he had the idea of the Cartesian plane from a dream, which he attributed yeah, yeah. to divine intervention. Uh, Kepler's model of benzene. Uh, yeah, that one. Structure of the periodic table. Um, oh, really? Yes, he saw it in a dream. Um, famously, he wrote. I it. knew about the ring or or whatever the the yeah, molecular yeah. Ring. ring. The periodic table. Multiple mathematicians reported. Um, yeah. I see. I mean, um, 
uh, what's his name, uh, Ramayanan, uh, would see all his equations painted in blood every night when he slept by the, uh, you know, by his family's, you know, goddess that, that Hindu goddess that he worshipped. Wow. I mean, there's a bunch of um, a bunch of this stuff out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the basic premise of the dogma, the central dogma of biology, quote unquote, is that information can only pass from DNA to protein via RNA. Uh, that's basically the, that's it. Now, this has been completely invalidated. Um, we now know and have known for actually for decades uh, of examples in different organisms I mean, it only takes one, right? But there are many examples in many different organisms that information can flow every conceivable direction in the cell. So DNA to protein, protein to DNA, DNA to RNA, RNA to DNA, protein to RNA, RNA to protein. Right. There's, no, there's no such barrier. Um, we can it's, discuss some of these examples, but- It's not just purely bottom up. It's, it's not just the, the magic privileged germplasm, which is what everything really is. It's not just everything arising out of that. It goes both ways. There's like we talked about in the last video, there's, there's this double causation going on or, or a loop or a yeah. triangle as you have here. There are feedback loops. And yeah. this, as illustrated here, um, you know, these, uh, carriers of information act on themselves and they act on every other type of carrier of information. There's no, I mean, there is privileging in degree. I mean, they form different functions of the cell, but there is no absolute barriers. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, he wrote of in Molecules and Men, he wrote, the ultimate aim of the modern movement in biology is to explain all biology in terms of physics and chemistry. Now, this, I, I think, is what set biology on a dead-end track for the last half century. So instead of focusing on what makes you different from, you know, the chair you're sitting on, right? Biologists have tried to understand life by trying to add up its inanimate components rather than to study the, what emerges from the sum of their parts. Which um, again, those maybe i'm over hitting this on the head i've just been thinking about it so much but it's like again we i i'm not convinced that we even understand what the chair is anymore the by which i mean the atoms or whatever the, those individual molecules making up the chair it's just continually assumed by people you know this billiard ball model of where they're all just tiny little solids hitting each other and it's like that's not how it is we but they keep bringing it in because it's so useful for the theory to make it this purely mechanistic thing. But anyway, right, yeah, no, I, I mean, preach. Newtonian, you're right. I mean, physics works on a macro scale. It's very easy to see you know, yes. the billiard balls. But uh, yeah, the, dig, the, deep, the deeper you dig, the more, uh, the weirder it gets and the less and less, uh, less and less are these models um, do they make sense? Even though quantum physics is very accurate in some of its predictions, yes. its ability to be constructed bottom up uh, is, is a real problem. I mean, they're incommensurate models, multiple yeah. incommensurate models in physics. Um, you plug in one equation you get here, you plug in the answer there, and you end up with complete nonsense. You can't, yes. there's no bottom up calculation. And it's really reached a crisis point in physics. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So this model, kind of the combination of the central dogma and of biology combined with the modern synthesis of, as an evolutionary paradigm, you know, these things, all these things required shoring up. Um, there had to be ad hoc modifications and as I mentioned before, there arose a distinction, kind of like in physics, a distinction between um, mass effects, the effects of populations of particles, right? Thermodynamics, physical chemistry, and the behavior of the individual 
particle itself, sort of uh, quantum chemistry. Yes. Right. These two, these these fields grew apart, and they and similarly in biology things grew apart. There were these evolutionary biologists who studied who became who were basically like math modeling of of, uh, of populations, ecologists. This was a this was a different view, a different perspective of the same, you know, the same object of study. And then there were molecular geneticists, people who were digging into the actual mechanism, the origin of, you know, what were assumed to be quote unquote random mutations. And I, I'll mention there that, it, assuming I understand correctly, the in the physics, you know, part of the reason for that divide is precisely because they they found that when you take you know a bajillion atoms and you let them play out, then they'll they'll behave more or less classically. All of the old models tend to work. They'll behave like waves. Light will behave more or less like waves. But when you take them individually, that's when you really start getting all of the all of the really weird stuff. When you try to pinpoint why each of those individual uh, uh, atoms or, or photons that make up the wave as sort of an emergent property. Why did this photon end up here? It just becomes completely indeterministic. We can't figure out. We might as well say that they're choosing to go there and because they're that's they're following the Holy Ghost or something. Like <laughs> it's like we have no idea. Uh, I just thought that was interesting. You drawing a kind of similar comparison here of. Uh, oh yeah. Studying. In some case, the models were taken wholesale. For for instance. Um, I mean, even the, the terminology of it for, so in the classical view of the modern synthesis, evolution really is defined as shifting frequencies right. of genes in the gene pool, which maintains sort of an abundance of infinitesimal random variations. And accordingly, sort of evolutionary causes are conceived of as forces or pressures that cause mass action shifts in this hydrostatically modeled gene pool. Um, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very much, I think, analogous to uh, some of these concepts in physics. Um, in, in this view, mutation is seen as sort of a weak force that's opposed effectively by the strong, much stronger force of selection. And so it can be mathematically ignored. Um, given that, say, mutation rates are very low. Um, now, this view suggests that an effect of mutation would depend on the specific conditions, such as an unnaturally high rate of mutation or the absence of selection. Uh, that is to say, something called neutral evolution. Indeed, um, some of the research literature that's pretty conventional uh, tends to associate mutation biased evolution with neutral evolution, which was a uh, an advance, a controversial advance, some still kind of argue with, I think Dawkins takes issue with it, um, by a Kimura, a Japanese um, uh, biologist. Uh, the idea being that when selection is non-existent, the effect of mutation predominates, which kind of makes sense if you, yeah. if you think about it in terms of these shifts of genetic you know, pools. And of course, there's other phenomena. This idea of punctuated equilibrium, the idea that not so much that there are times of rapid change, but there are long stretches of ecological time when nothing seems to happen from an evolutionary right. standpoint. Um, and, uh, and there were, you know, I mean, people who, who looked at, who tried to look at things honestly. I mean, Stephen Gould, Stephen Jay Gould said, quote, if acquired characteristics are inherited only rarely and weakly, then Lamarckism might aid natural selection in developing adaptation more quickly, a position advocated by Darwin himself throughout the origin. Mm -hmm. But if acquired characteristics are inherited faithfully all the time, then natural selection will be overwhelmed and Lamarckism becomes a refutation of Darwinism. Relative frequency determines the, dis the distinction. This is from the structure of evolutionary theory in 2002. So people thought about this some seriously and carefully and uh, would, you know, proposed all kinds of variations to 
what is the overall overarching assumptions of the modern synthesis in order to really help deal with some of the observations and inconsistencies. Now, where does this, going back a little bit, where does this random mutation assumption come from? Well, this is something that I was taught in school. Uh, this specific experiment, the famous uh, Delbrook and Luria experiment in 1943, which quote unquote proved that, uh, you know, this assumption by pop population genesis that mutations are random. So Delbrook and Luria in a similar experiment by Esther and Joshua Lederberg um, gave bacteria a lethal stressor Okay, in their experiment, they inoculated a small plate of bacteria, a small number of bacteria, E. coli, onto separate culture tubes, let them grow, and then plated them on cultures containing some sort of uh, T1 phage, a virus that would kill the bacteria. If resistance to the virus and the bacteria were caused by um, an induction of resistance, sort of uh, adaptation, if resistance were not due to a heritable genetic component, then each plate should contain roughly the same number of resistant colonies. Assuming a constant rate of mutation, Luria hypothesized that if mutations occurred after and in response to exposure of the selective agent, the number of survivors would be distributed according to a Poisson distribution with a mean equal to the variance. Um, you know, this is all technical stuff, but in the bottom line is this is not what they found. They found that the number of resistant colonies in each plate varied dramatically. So because the variance was considerably greater than the mean, um, you can see this in the B column, it means that this was an inherent characteristic, an inherent genetic uh, property of the plated E. coli. So they, this was purely based on what they already had in them uh, already. This wasn't any kind of adaptation to the stressful environment of the bacteria page. Now, um, okay, great. Now this doesn't prove that uh, induced resistance cannot occur, right? It, it, it just shows you that if you subject an organism to a sufficiently powerful stressor that kills off all the ones that already don't have some sort of inherent genetic mutation, then yeah, then it's uh, really, you're just seeing what, you're just trying to reveal what genetic resistance they inherently have. We'll talk about some experiments later, which show that bacteria subjected to sublethal stressors are actually able to, uh, through various mechanisms, develop uh, develop their own adaptive uh, escape mechanisms. Right, which would make more sense because if you just kill them, then they're obviously they can't change anything in themselves anymore. I know I'm oversimplifying, but it's like if, if but if you do less than lethal so that they still survive, then you've smacked them and they can kind of adapt from there. Well, I'll, I'll let you go over it. Just no, right, right. <laughs> when, when you well, get I'm to saying it. is that this, 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 is, this is in the textbooks, but it's right. not a proof of, you're not, you're not proving that this is the only, only mechanism. It's not really a proof of random mutation. It's, it's, you know, it's a reasonable experiment for its time, but it's hardly, it's hardly proving that only random mutations occur, you know? Right. Um, so praise science, right? This is, uh, <laughs> this is our sort of, this is the, the model that we have been working with for a long time. What a lot of smart scientists believe, unfortunately. And there are many questions that can be asked. So one obvious question is, how did life arise in the first place? So if new genes, uh, I mean, forget about genes, how, how did natural selection pressure inorganic matter to acquire the characteristics of life in the first place? Does that make sense? I mean, yes, you have to posit yes it does. Sort of, uh, you have to posit 
and physicists have actually posited some interesting ideas. Um, you have to posit some sort of other, more global, more fundamental aspect to, uh, to matter, to explain its ability to organize itself into a living system. Um, and there you are- obviously have Dawkins' idea of the replicators, but I never really found, I mean, I've only read The Selfish Gene once, so I'm by no means an expert, but <laughs> I just never found it very compelling. It didn't seem very fleshed out. It seems like there's too many factors, but I didn't know if that's what you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, it's partly, yeah. There are, there are physicists who claim that there are sort of uh, thermodynamic parameters that life optimizes in a way that's magnitudes ahead of non-living. Uh, systems, right, and that it is through this sort of uh, thermodynamic equilibrium optimization of energy flux that um, sort of life is an inevitable uh, progression of uh, of any non-living system that is placed in the right conditions for a long enough time. The, you know, this is all kind of speculative and interesting, but, uh, you know, it's at least trying to get at the question, something that biologists, you know, they, for some reason, are resistant to. Um, I mean, no complete theories exist, right? Testability is limited. Uh, but we'll ignore this question because we have to deal with the fact of life itself. So um, dealing with what we have, uh, Another thought that arises. So, if if or if new genes are modified old genes, then how do new genes arise in the first place? Right. So, if, right. If you have if 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 random mutation works on infinitesimal variations, how does something completely novel arise? Right. Or if it doesn't, it has to occur gradually. Well, is that what the what the genetic record suggests, uh, well, maybe not. Um, and we can talk about evidence of that in a bit. There's obviously the Cambrian explosion is the one a lot of people go to, but there's a reason they go to it. And all this, so many new body patterns, completely different body patterns arise in evolutionary terms, as I understand it, very, very quickly and then fade out fairly quickly, which really messes with the gradual theory. I mean, with the gradual theory, it should just be like constant over time. But like was mentioned before, it's like there's this punctuation in the equilibrium where it's almost like sudden leaps and then nothing happens. And then a sudden leap and then nothing happens. We can, we can say we have, you know, archeological evidence is unreliable, but let's look okay. at the okay. of it. Yeah, let's, I mean, Let's talk about how we actually see uh, lineages of organisms and how their genes evolve. Because in that, we can see things that completely blow up um, you know, these assumptions of the modern synthesis alone. And which is what this talk is mainly focusing on. I bring in to bear very little archeological evidence. Um, that, it's really all uh, molecular genetics. Uh, this, this, is, this is very good because I, I have no idea what you even mean by by genetic uh, information that would bear on this question. So I'm very sure. interested to know. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, so this question of how do novel genes arise in the first place? Um, can organisms genetically modify themselves and their offspring? And why not? To what extent are organisms aware of the genetic material? Right? Is there a does, does the biological system have a meta level of encoding of say what genes are where on the, on the chromosomes and what structure or modifications are present on the chromosomes that allow internal modification? Does such a system exist? Is that even conceivable? Um, what degree of self-awareness does an organism have of its, of its, you know, of its uh, genetic code? Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact of repair itself implies a degree of awareness, um, but it's limited. So maybe there's more. Now, so, and we talked about mutations and the assumption of randomness. 
So are mutations truly random and independent of each other in the environment? Now, obviously there are mutagenic chemicals that disrupt sort of the structure of DNA, DNA repair mechanisms, or gross chromosomal structure, but these are external toxins and act usually non-specifically, randomly and directly. Um, and as I mentioned, being able to repair something suggests an awareness of the genome. Otherwise there would be no repair mechanism, right? I mean, to repair something means you know what it should say. You have to be able um, to specify. Yes, exactly. And, uh... um, but the random mutation model suggests that errors are the result of sort of failure to dutifully copy or failing to recognize and repair an injury or disruption. It kind of rejects the idea of positive errors or sort of intentional active modifications um, why not look for them? So uh, again, these are all questions that would sort of blow up the hypothesis uh, or the model of the modern synthesis. And these are things that have been actually questions that have been neglected. And I can show you that evidence has accumulated that sort of answers all these questions in a way that's not favorable to the modern synthesis. So, I've been uh, teasing you a lot, but let's go back one more time to kind of review this, the idea of the assumptions, sort of the underlying assumptions of the, of the scientists who are, who've been practicing and that are kind of limiting our scope and understanding. So this is a table that's straight from Rupert Sheldrake's Science Set Free. It provides sort of a, a timetable and a, a little graph that sort of describes the uh, the relationship between God and nature of a particular worldview. So we can say, go back to say his traditional Christian worldview and you know something in the medieval uh, metaphysics and talk about how God is interactive with the world and how nature is animate. Mm -hmm. So there's an agency on the part of, of some sort of highest creator and there's an active agency on the part of nature itself, okay? So these are sort of two loci of agency, if you will. Now, the early enlightenment, so this is sort of Descartes' view, was perhaps that God was interactive with the world, but that nature was mechanistic, okay? And that we could say evolved into sort of enlightenment deism, which in which God was only a creator who set in motion a mechanism, a machine of nature, mm -hmm. okay? And no longer, no longer tinkered with it. Now. This is a fascinating chart, by the way. I, <laughs> this is kind of cool. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. That's why I included it. And you can think of sort of the Romantic era. Yeah. And which is a sort of a reaction to some extent to the Enlightenment. And we could see a reassertion of an animate nature, mm -hmm. but the maintaining of, say, a creator god who breathed life into these, you know, into the, the clay and then let it run, right? Then you have sort of a romantic atheism in which there is no God, but nature is still animate. So this may be sort of a, you know, a modern version of sort of primitive animism. Although even really primitive tribes usually have a creator. So yeah. probably be more like romantic deists, but uh, this romantic atheism, which is animate nature and a absent God or creator, gave way to sort of the reductive materialism of science in which there is no God and nature is actually still a machine of atoms colliding according to pre-specified rules. Yes. So it's been stripped entirely, the metaphysics have been stripped entirely of agency. Um, and, you know, this, this sort of these clockwork model, these clockwork universe models, um, are really still the basis of modern, of modern rationalist philosophy. So, 
they're expanding these cause effect chains as the only legitimate means of understanding the world. But in a way, it's inherently theistic. Because if you, uh, the modern twist is that if, uh, if you replace dualism with a materialistic monism, which is the ultimate expression of rationalism, you're kind of negating the very concept of rationality or that there is any mind at all to conceive or to understand the world. Um, the theory of mind becomes a real problem with this yes. world. And uh, if you dismiss it as not real or epiphenomenal or meaningful, uh, it really leads to, and here we, we, go to, uh, we go to Nietzsche who really outlined the result of this bleak nihilism uh, and had some choice words for modern science. So uh, gone alas is his faith in his dignity, uniqueness, irreplaceableness and the rank ordering of beings. He has become animal, literally unqualifiedly and unreservedly an animal. Man who in his earlier faiths was almost God, child of God, man of God. And Nietzsche goes on to say, Extreme positions are not succeeded by moderate ones, but by extreme positions of the opposite kind. Thus, the belief in the absolute immorality of nature, in aim and meaninglessness, is the psychologically necessary affect once the belief in God and an essentially moral order becomes untenable. Hmm. It is the most scientific of all possible hypotheses. We deny end goals. If existence had them, had one, it would have to have been reached. That science is possible in this sense that is cultivated today is proof that all elementary instincts, life's instincts of self-defense and protection no longer function. We no longer collect. We squander the capital of our ancestors, even in the way in which we seek knowledge. In the natural sciences, meaninglessness, causalism, mechanism, lawfulness, an entracte, a residue. So uh, yeah, whew, that's classic Freddy for you. Um, I've never heard anyone call him Freddy. That's my new favorite thing. <laughs> but, but you see here, you see that this is sort of an etiolated, you know, etiolated, weakened, you know, pathetic, um, you know, the, the, the decadent, life-denying priests of of, of the Old Testament have become the scientists of today, is basically <laughs> his, um, his, uh, his point. And uh, oh, he, he, hits, he hits nail on the head here. I mean, it's when you deny life, the instincts of life, you lead to some pretty, pretty boring and sterile <laughs> um, places. At its worst, or at, at its best, I would rather say. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, so now finally we get to, you know, this has all been introduction. Uh, <laughs> so finally we get to sort of the, the defense of the thesis. Uh, this is the human karyotype. Very exciting. So what does this mean? It's a pretty picture of the contents of a cell's carrion, meaning the nucleus, the nut of the cell. So these are, tightly bound continuous segments of DNA, which are actually bound to a massive structure of regulatory and scaffolding proteins. This is what the chromosome is in its condensed form. Now, this only occurs during cell division and normally these chromosomes are decondensed and the, the, the DNA is active. This is how it looks when it's finally condensed. We humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. There are 22 autosomes, which are the so-called. And then there's a pair of sex determining chromosomes. So the X and the Y. All the other ones have pairs and are numbered. Whereas the X and the Y don't really pair together, but they're a set that determines sex. That makes sense to, and yes. most people know this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of each of these pairs is provided by our biological parents. Uh, the assumption is randomly, 
but uh, that's not actually true because actually there's a selection that occurs on the level of mammalian sperm in which the the one with the greatest fighting spirit basically or something succeeds there's a lot of, uh, okay. a lot of stuff that goes on there on the level of actual sperm selection so it's not true that these things are given to us randomly oh that's a very that's that just in itself is a very interesting little point yeah, yeah. I, it it's it you could say that it's and even there i'm not quite sure but you could say it's random putting it into each of the individual sperm but Putting it into the sperm is not what creates the baby. It's the sperm's right. actually reaching the egg. Yeah, there's yeah, many yeah. slip between cup and lip. And that's anytime that occurs in biology, anytime you have a, a space, there's room for some sort of regulatory effect. Right. Uh, keep that in mind because there is space between everything. <laughs> so every step along the way, there's some degree of, of, of regulation, right. possible feedback. Um, so furthermore, now if, if we have at least two copies of each gene, one from each parent, one in each of these chromosomes, you know, that, that raises the question of how does the organism know which version of a particular gene to select, to transcribe, to, to activate? Uh, now, for a long time, the assumption was randomly but this has been proven to be false. Uh, the ability to select and express the best gene on a pair kind of requires a degree of understanding of what, what it means. There has to be some sort of higher level metagenomic, you could call it, or epigenetic regulatory framework, right? A cell has to interpret the code, not just faithfully copy right. it verbatim. Uh, in fact, we know many genetic disorders Crater Willy, Angelman's, and numerous other ones, which involve exactly these regulatory mechanisms and um, imprinting problems. Um, additionally, if you're a woman, you have not an X and a Y, but an X and an X. Now, this would give you a lot more genes than a man. So in you know, a woman's cells will actually silence one of the X chromosomes, partially. But how is that decided? So which one does it silence? Again, this was always assumed to be random, but we've now proven that it's not. Um, and keep in mind that this is unique to humans. So other animals, and this is a good time to discuss this, other animals have a different numbers of chromosomes completely and use completely different methods to determine sex. Really? Yes. So there are animals in which those with, with a pair of chromosomes are female and those that have one are male. So for example, the male jack jumper ant has one set of chromosomes. The female has two. That's basically the difference between them. Um, some plants have hundreds, even thousands of chromosomes. They've some protozoa have thousands of tiny chromosomes. Um, the number of copies of each also varies from species to species. There are triploid animals, animals, there are tetraploid. There are plants that are octoploid. Uh, they have eight pairs of, I mean, eight chromosomes, instead of eight sets, instead of a pair. Instead of two, they have eight. They can have three, they can have four. Mm -hmm. um, there is even differences between tissue to tissue. So for example, we know that triploidy of the of chromosome 21, which is the smallest one, um, that leads to Down syndrome. So if you have three uh, chromosome 21s, you will get the syndrome known as Down syndrome. But your salivary glands contain non-standard amounts of numbers of chromosomes normally. So if you biopsy someone's salivary gland and you look at the cells there, they have all kinds of weird numbers of chromosomes. Huh. Why? Um, the silk glands of the commercial silkworm contain like over a million copies of these chromosomes, for example. So secretory glands bulk up their ability to, pro to create proteins by just copying the chromosomes over and over. Um, there are animals who, for example, the platypus has 
pairs of sex of autosomes, right? They have the same kind of pairs, pairs of autosomes, but their sex determining chromosomes, they have five of them. So a male platypus is X, 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 Y, 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 Y. We don't we're, know. Uh, we don't know. Okay. That, that, <laughs> that's what I was waiting for is I'm like, so why is all of this craziness? So, so the answer is always, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll get to this in the next slide. But uh, the relationship between chromosome structure and function is completely unknown in biology. Okay. In fact, the platypus sex determination was really only really hammered down in like 2002, uh -huh. 2004. There was a paper that finally hammered down like what the hell is going on. <laughs> they, they, they figured it out. And birds, for example, they don't have X and Y. They have what's called a ZW system where the uh -huh. female bird has a Z, like a Z chromosome and a W chromosome. I mean, they look the same. They're not the, the shape, the letters in the shape don't. Yeah, yeah. They have a ZW and the male kind of like a human female has XX um, instead of, but instead of an XX, the male has the ZZ. So there are, they have the exact same, but the female has the one that's, that's, that's off, that's different. Oh. So in many birds and many reptiles and other animals, they have this ZZ system um, in which the, the female is the odd one out, has a, a, an unpaired chromosome. So that's, uh, I mean, that's, it's weird, right? It's, it's all very interesting. What, what does it mean? We don't know. Um, now a little bit about how DNA works. The, the, the point, just, just to make clear, the point of all that just to establish the, the how exactly, what's exactly going on with the chromosomes is definitely not set in stone yet. No, there's, it's there's extremely fluid. Um, yeah. Things can vary enormously, even between very closely related species. We're gonna- Even within the same species. That was the thing that kind of struck me is the oh, idea no, that- uh, it's closely related species. Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, the numbers of chromosomes vary between, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like within the salivary glands versus elsewhere, oh, yeah. where it's like, oh, <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Yeah, the idea that all the cells in our body have the same DNA is uh, is not true. We'll explore mm -hmm. that, that there's actually differences in, um, in how our DNA changes in different tissues. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but let us first define some other terms. So we talked about what chromosomes are. Um, and uh, we're gonna have to define a lot of terms because many people use these terms like the word gene gets thrown around a lot, but what does it actually mean? Uh, unfortunately, as we'll see later, the definition is uh, disconcerting at best. So uh, let us define some other terms. So it's the basics of how DNA works. Um, so there's a simple illustration uh, of how sort of the flow of information goes in the very, very, very basic kind of way. Um, there's a process of transcription. And this is very important, transcription in which DNA is transcribed into an RNA intermediate. So DNA stands for deoxy, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is uh, ribonucleic acid. So it's a slightly different molecule. It's basically otherwise very similar. In school, the, the way it was diagrammed was the DNA is the double helix and the RNA just has the one side of it. Um, yeah, that's, so I I mean, RNA can form all kinds of shapes. Yeah in all kinds of ways. But yeah, the, the DNA is the one that comes in the classic double helix, which is a very interesting structure for many reasons. Um, but DNA gets unzipped. It can also be single-stranded. I mean, but yeah, DNA is the famous, uh, the famous double helix, as you say. Um, the, the, uh, the process of translation is then the conversion of the, the generation basically, the creation of a protein strand from the RNA code. So in between all this, there are various enzymes that perform all these functions and that uh, 
and that, as I shall show, not only modify the expression of DNA, but can actually tag the DNA in a way that sets it up for um, active change uh, by the organism. So there's a, for example, there's a, uh, there's an enzyme called cytosine deaminase, which goes in and modifies the DNA. It, uh, it changes the cytosine uh, residue, the C, to, uh, to a different nucleotide, quite simply. So uh, okay. that alone, that yeah. alone kind of disproves the idea that DNA is not modified. But uh, it's, it's all about the sort of the, the context and heritability, which we'll get to. Um, and of course, proteins affect the folding of other proteins. So there, if we go back to the central dogma, we see that there are all kinds of mechanisms by which information can flow all throughout this triangle of DNA, protein, and RNA. So uh, this, is, this is sort of an outdated little uh, square of, of uh, data that is a little diagram that shows some of these mechanisms that are, that are known, but we'll explore many more that we can add on to here. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the genome structure. So we saw sort of the chromosomes. We have a, a very high level view of what's going on. But as we dig down deeper, we'll see that there's a lot more interesting stuff. So that is an African marbled lungfish. Uh, it's a pretty primitive ancient fish it has a genome that's 40 times bigger than a human's. Why is that? We don't know, right? Um, surely scientists are curious, right? Now, there are other organisms, amoebae, that have even more massive DNA caches that are 100 times bigger than a human's. Um, even closely related organisms can have magnitude or orders of magnitude differences in DNA content. So. You, there's one point that you take away, it's that structure function relationship uh, remains an enigma. In fact, there's a term for this, it's called the C value paradox. And uh, of course, when you have enough paradoxes in a scientific field, you know it's time for a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's the onion, okay? This is a little- I think I've heard of this one, yeah. The onion yeah. test, right? A simple reality check for anyone who thinks that they can assign a function to every nucleotide in the human genome. Quote, whatever your proposed functions are, ask yourself this question, why does an onion need a genome that is five times larger than ours? Okay, like, what is the meaning of this, right? The thought that keeps popping to my head is that my, my uh, 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 I, I have some friends who do computer programming and uh, it, the, the first thing that pops into my head is it's like, oh, somebody's, our genome's a lot more tightly programmed than the onions. Whoever did the onion just rattled it off and hasn't done any cleaning. And so there's all kinds of just extra junk in there that isn't, isn't useful or that, <laughs> is it, well, I'm sure that's, uh, I don't know how, how far that you can translate that, but I mean, my mind is instantly just like, okay, what are reasons for, for what's going on here. But, well, um, that's exactly what scientists assumed for the longest time. Right. Is, you probably heard the term of junk DNA, right? So yeah, I was going to mention that. Exactly. So this pie chart that, you see, that we see here, yeah. the breakdown of the human genome. So total coding regions for protein. This is, this is piece, parts of the DNA that are transcribed right, into RNA and then translated into protein, mm -hmm. or just transcribed to be special RNA enzymes, which is another issue we didn't talk about, but it's fine. This represents less than 1.5% of the genome. That's the exons there. That's the, that's the exons, that's right. Now, uh, these are called exons. So these are, these are parts of the genome that are transcribed and then translated. Now, as it turns out, sperm cells, 
cancer cells, the ova, a lot of active tissues, certain special kinds of situations, a lot more DNA gets transcribed. Okay. So in the testicles, about 30% of the, of the actual DNA or more gets transcribed. 30 to 50%, I think is the numbers they're giving. That's interesting. It's transcribed, and then what happens to it? We don't know. Right. It's not translated into any proteins. It's, we'll get to some ideas of what it might be doing. Um, but it's probably no coincidence that this is occurring in the, the reproductive organs. Uh, so that's weird. Mm -hmm. But something to keep in mind. Five percent. I didn't realize it was that dramatic. It's thirty to. It's at least thirty percent. So right in in the testicles. In the uh, testicles is transcribed. What happens? Right. But it's not coding for protein. We're we're not sure. Right. What it we can talk about some theories later when we get to that. Now, um, as far as variations between people, as you know, this always comes up. Like, what are the genetic? You know, people say, you know, you share, you know, forty percent of your DNA with a banana or 99%, you know, 97% of your DNA with a chimp. Well, sort of. I mean, in reality, uh, even between people, there's about 5% structural variation of like mm -hmm. insertions, deletions, inversions, large tandem repeats. These are large structural, uh, structural variants that are in the silent portion, right? I'm talking about the 90, 8.5% that we haven't you know, talked about. That stuff can be variant. Now, in terms of actual alleles that code for protein within that 1.5%, now there's 0.03% that varies individual nucleotides from person to person. So it's true in a way that, yes, we share a lot of in common, but then if you look, there's also a significant variation that's, that's far outsizes these tiny allelic variations within the overall structure. Um, and so what that means is that in terms of actual proteins that have various sequences, um, up to 50% of proteins vary from human being to human being. Um, so in any between, between any two people, up to half of their functional proteins can be different in terms of the actual sequence. Now, what relevance does this have? Very little, obviously, that people are fairly similar. We can right. interbreed. We're, we're the same species, right? But uh, that's something to keep in mind. So the, the, the idea here being that although we're the same species, you, there is, well, I'm just repeating what you said. There's a lot of difference between individual individual human beings. To I'll, I'll let you keep going. I'm kind of just trying to process. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is just sort of sort of stuff to kind of help contextualize things. Uh, it yeah. doesn't really, it doesn't really it has, it's neither really here nor there overall. But what is important is what I want to talk about next, which is sort of the mutation rate of different parts of the genome. So if you consider the genome to be like right 1.5 percent coding transcribed and translated into actual proteins actually used as it were uh, as far as we can tell yeah actually that manifests right yeah it's yeah the stuff that that makes up the phenotype right so the genotype is the is the dna sort of the, the particular right. dna the phenotype is the thing that natural selection sees right so there is again a slip between cup and lip. So there is this hidden variation to an extent. There are, there, are, there are changes within the genome that are inaccessible apparently to natural selection because they are occurring in areas that are not translated and transcribed into actual body, into the soma, into protein. You see that there's a massive disconnect and this is something that needs explaining. Right. Um, going back, how does natural selection occur on this 98.5% of the genome that doesn't seem to manifest physically? Right. In terms of protein, it's an, it's an interesting question. 
Um, you know, let's look at the rest of the pie chart here. So we looked at the tiny sliver of exons. Again, exons is a term used for regions of genes coding for protein, RNA, which is, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or tRNA, transfer RNA or, uh, or uh, ribosome RNA. This is just- no, I, I remember from high school science, yeah. <laughs> the basics. Transfer RNA, these are special kinds of RNA that are involved in the translation and that are involved in the translation process. That's mm -hmm. all you have to know. It's, it's a special type of RNA. And there are many different types of specialized RNA, which we'll get to in a little bit. But there is also something called introns. Okay, so introns are the stuff that you cut out between the exons. So, it, so basically a quarter of the genome is introns. These are sequences that are transcribed from the DNA into RNA, but are never translated into protein. Okay, these are just like stuff that you cut out that ends up on the cutting room floor, so to speak, of a of a, of a film. It's, it's weird, it must serve some kind of function. Now, beyond that is something called unique non-coding DNA, um, which is not transcribed. Um, and that's about 15%. And that includes something called pseudogenes, which look like protein coding regions, but um, are not, not really transcribed or translated. That's kind of, it's thought to be maybe uh, kind of like ancestral genes that are kind of not doing anything. There's a lot of different theories. Now, finally, we get to the largest portion, which is indicated in green on the pie chart. Now, this represents about two thirds of the actual DNA. And this is something called sort of repetitive elements. There are various classes of, this, of these repetitive elements. Now, let me repeat this. So two thirds of your genome is the equivalent of falling asleep on your keyboard, right? Or just copying and pasting a paragraph over and over and over and over. Oh, okay. Right? Right, right. That's, that's weird, right? By so, the falling asleep on the keyboard, you mean like M, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, alternating letters or just one like right it's not just like we it's not just it's not being manifested it's also like it's just nonsense in a way well is it so this is the question right there are different kinds um but they're not all that simple i mean some of them are actually um so we look down at the chart there are these large segment duplications which are literally just duplicated identical sequences um there are simple sequences of DNA. And so 15% are what are called repetitive DNA unrelated to transposable elements, okay? And then 44% are repetitive DNA that includes transposable elements and repetitive sequences. So what is a transposable element? Well, we'll talk about this, but basically it's a chunk of DNA that replicates itself and then reinserts itself back in the genome. These are thought to be um, kind of like what it might, might be referred to as endogenous retroviruses, or rather endogenous retroviruses are actually a category of these things because some of them are way bizarre. So think of it like a virus that has been embedded in your DNA forever and has passed down through your germline and it just replicates itself. It's almost That's, like hangers on. Yeah. Yeah, huh. but as we shall see, this is, it's not that simple. They're not parasitic. Okay. So, or at least not all of them are. Now, um, this is exactly what people have referred to as junk DNA. Now we've all okay. heard this term, right? Junk DNA. But have you heard of the term uh, incompetent and arrogant scientists with no <laughs> information? No? Okay. Yes, well, Ilya, I have heard that from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that may be a better term to use. <laughs> oh boy. Um, because uh, they're the ones who deserve credit for the term junk DNA. Uh, despite 
claims by Crick in the 1970s, as late as, as the 1970s, that, quote, it conveys little or no selective advantage to the organism, or actually later claims um, that it represents like, a, as you say, like a hanger on, a selfish parasitic sequence. Um, these so-called, you know, junk actually provides the, some of the, the tools for a self-directed biological engineering capacity in eukaryotic organisms. Now compared to prokaryotes, um, which are bacteria, um, eukaryotic organisms, ones that have a true nucleus and are all of multicellular life, uh, our genomes as eukaryotes contain many, many more of these repetitive sequences. Interestingly, archaea, which are a, uh, a kingdom of life that is in some ways uh, intermediate between bacteria yeah. and eukaryotes, they contain an intermediate amount of these uh, repetitive sequences. So there's clearly some relationship between these repetitive sequences and complexity of the organism, at least on a very, very broad scale. So keep that in mind. Uh, now, according to the modern synthesis, as I mentioned before, this presents a problem because most of the areas in which mutations can and do occur is opaque to natural selection. As I said, the phenotype is determined by the expressed proteins. And that's a very, very small sliver of what our genome is. Oh, I see where you're going with this. So the, right. the physical variations in the species, right, are really only related to that tiny sliver, that tiny 1.5% of the chart, as far as we understand, right? So, right, so j j in, in other words, natural selection only can act on stuff that, like, like with the classic notion of I don't know if this quite applies, but like uh, uh, bird beaks or something, how yeah, depending on um, the the shape of the beak would be an expression of the phenotype. There, it, it, it would be a phenotype. Um, and that is something that natural selection can act on because it's actually manifesting when there are the environmental pressures in the environment and enables them to survive. The stuff that pertains to that, the, the genetic structure that pertains to those sorts of phenotypes are a very tiny slice. And so you have all this other DNA. DNA is supposed to be sort of the engine behind or the, the explanatory thing behind uh, evolution via natural selection. But 98.5% of the DNA has nothing to do with natural selection or anything like genetic drift or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, um, it's opaque. It's opaque. Yeah, yeah. And its function is unknown. So yeah. that's that's the real issue. Uh, what I mean, if the shape of the bird beak is determined by any of this stuff, well, I mean, shouldn't we look at its function? Clearly, it's right, right, you know, right. In our understanding of it and and what exists. And you you feel that th it's not just that they. Uh that this stuff has not been looked into properly because of certain, I guess, agenda is the first word that comes to mind. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you call yeah. something junk, I feel like- Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, your, there's your emotional valence towards it right away. Instead yeah, yeah. Of, wow, instead of saying the unknown genome of, you know, the unknown uh, G DNA of curiosity. Yeah, know, yeah. Part of the issue. Hey, uh, let me pause right here. I got to sure what's going on absolutely uh hey everybody we're getting tired <laughs> because hey, this is this is good stuff but it's taking longer than than uh, we thought so we're going to do a part two that won't mean as much to you because i'm going to upload these together but just so you know you should go to the part two video um uh, as we really get into the rubber hitting the road so Ilya, thank you so much I'll see Absolutely. you in, in the next one. Well, I mean, I'll see you after I start the recording. But anyway, thank you all for watching. Head over to the next one.